What's up YouTube and welcome back to the channel. This is going to be part two of the Coleman Columbia pop-up makeover slash complete remodel. I am, as you can see, standing in my own construction zone. We are currently remodeling our house. Another reason for the delay for this video, so I do apologize. It has been way too long since I posted the other one, but this project's been going on for way too long also. <laughs> um, so I wanted to get this out to you. In this part, I'm hoping to go over, well, I'm not hoping, I am going to go over how I redid things in the galley and all the little details that weren't shown in the first part or weren't done in the first part. Um, so I want to get this out and get it to you. So I wanted to make this short interlude just so you had an understanding of this is my life right now and that's why i haven't had a chance to edit it not only that some computer issues with memory crashing and all that fun stuff has been going on also so if you like this video please hit that like and subscribe button if you want to follow along on this project please hit that bell notification i promise i'll get some more of these out soon and i'm hoping this project will be done soon so that i can get back to the pop-up so I can go out and actually rest and relax without all of yeah, that. All right, so here we go. And this is part two of the Coleman pop-up. There'll be plenty of parts because there's a lot I want to do to this pop-up and it's not quite done. So enjoy. So let's get started on this part two where we are going to cover how I redid the entire galley and how I redid the cushions, curtains, and privacy valences balances, whatever you want to call it, for each of the bunk ends. So this is the original galley. You've seen this from the first one. Standard two burner stove, sink, pump. And then we're going to turn it into this. Uh, we weren't sure if we were going to keep the galley in the pop-up or not. I'm kind of glad we did because we do get a lot of use out of it. And to be honest with you, I'm not going to toot my own horn, but I'm really, really liking what I did to the galley. It's holding up and it just looks beautiful and matches everything in the pop-up. So the first step that you're going to want to do is we took the entire galley out of the pop-up and I bought a Rust-Oleum high-performance enamel flat white paint. Now the back and sides of the galley are metal, the front is wood. This high enamel paint actually worked really well on coverage for both of the areas. As you can see, I actually painted the doors at this point just to kind of make them match, but I knew ultimately I was not keeping these doors. Um, but this paint worked well. I left the original top on the top and sanded that so that I could put the new peel and stick top on the galley that you'll actually see in the next picture here. So in this step, I'm going to show you the sink and go over what I did for the top. Um, unfortunately, any of the pictures in the little video I had made about the top, I can't find it or it was lost whenever my hard drive had crashed. So first for the sink, this is actually the original sink. I used a Rust-Oleum metallic paint and primer and an aged copper finish. Painted the entire sink. Um, I believe I did about five coats after sanding in you know, prepping the sink itself. Um, then I went over all of that with a Rust-Oleum clear coat. And again, I think I did about three or four coats, let that set for a few days. And I also sanded in between each coat of that. Um, but I wanted to add a little bit extra protection just because water is your own worst enemy. If there was a spot or anything like that that water got into, it would have just ate the paint out. So I ended up taking this Rust-Oleum Never Wet and going over the entire surface of the sink with that. Um, I did two coats of that, and this sink has held up absolutely perfect. I mean, we've used it to wash dishes, wash our hands, all kinds of things, and it has held up through the testament of time. Um, there was one little nick that ended up in one of the corners, but I believe that happened more because I didn't quite cover that corner well. So, you know, that's the only problem. The thing you're going to notice in this picture is the edge of the top. Now, we redid this with a different type of trim um, because I didn't want to buy the traditional T-molding. It never lasts. It always gets too hot and expands and contracts and eventually falls out. I don't care what type of glue you use. You could use super glue and it still wouldn't stay inside. So what I ended up doing ultimately is I used the same type of peel and stick floor I used on the floor for the top. 
I use the same contact cement, put that down first, let that get tacky, then put the peel and stick floor down as the actual countertop. And then we went through and routered the edges. Now, once you take the T-molding out of the galley or out of your top countertop piece here, you'll notice that there is a quarter inch drop from the center to the middle or to the top where the actual peel and stick sat. So what I did was I took a router, measured down and routed out the entire edges. On the left here, you can see the type of trim that I used. It has a little L channel to the top of it. This fit in here perfectly so that once I routered out that edge, I was able to put a nice bead of um, industrial glue across that entire edge. And then I was able to actually fit this molding in perfectly so that it sat exactly level with the galley top. Now I did put a few finishing nails in there and in these pictures, you'll notice this, I took all these pictures prior to going through with the caulking and finishing up the holes so that you didn't see each of the finishing nail holes. But as you can see here, everything mitered perfectly at the corners. It sat in that track, well, not track, but that groove that we routed out of the top, absolutely perfect. One thing I will recommend that you don't see in this picture is you can see that little 16th of an inch gap between the countertop peel and stick and the actual trim. What I did is I took a just a clear caulking and went through and put a small bead and leveled it out um, to get rid of that gap so that because it's particle board underneath, I didn't want moisture seeping into there and eventually ultimately ruining the particle board. But all in all, I cannot you know, rave enough about how well that trim worked. It goes down a little bit further, so it gives you a little bit of a lip. And there's something I'm going to do with that later, but you know that'll be for a later video. Also, I had a glass cutting board sitting around that I ended up per not purchasing, but I got mirror holders for the wall and used those to actually hold the glass cutting board in place. Works perfect for putting your microwave here if you have one. Works great for us for putting our coffee pot here. We have a little toaster oven that sits there. That way it keeps the heat from, you know, the countertop since it's a peel and stick floor. It's going to be resilient, but not as much the heat. The pull bar on the back, I actually replaced that. I was able to order it online, I think for $8. Was not that expensive. And I just went over it with a stainless steel version of the Rust-Oleum paint so that it would match. So now we're going to move on to the doors. These doors are super simple. They are extremely easy to do. All I used was the same track molding that you saw that I used around the top of the um, galley. Same molding. Basically, you want to take your measurement for the door or the existing door. You want to use the same PVC trim as the galley top and basically make a picture frame because you have this little gap at the base of it. So once you make a picture frame, there is actually a nice, I wouldn't say it's quite a quarter inch, it's just under a quarter inch, but you can actually fit your wood or whatever paneling you would like to put on your door right behind that and it glues in perfect. And then what I did was, is I just put a piece of wood in an X pattern in the back of it to hold these in place. Not only that, this is the remaining pine board from the ceiling that I did from the first video. So since this is V-groove, I was actually able to take it. I took some wood glue, wood glue, clamped them together, glued it together, let it get nice and solid. Then I put it in to the door and ultimately this was the final product. Now again, in here, you'll see some of my mitered edges are not as butt up as I would like them to be. But so I went through with some paintable caulk and put it in those corners. Again, all of these pictures are prior to this finishing work being done. So ultimately, once I cleaned that up, all I did was put a little bit of sealant on the front of the pine boards and they just it matches the ceiling perfectly. So they kind of fit into the entire aesthetic that we were looking for. Now here, I'm just going to go over some brief steps for the bigger door. Now, in my galley, this had two separate doors with a post in the middle for the underneath the stove. I hated it. I have a portable stove that I wanted to put in there. You had to maneuver it around to manipulate it to be able to get it into there. So what I did was is I actually cut out the middle post for these two doors. 
did the exact same thing I did with the little door. So all you got to do is take your door, excuse me, door measurements and po build a picture frame and then put the pine boards inside. All I did was level and center everything with some tape and then I just added the hinges to the top. Now I did the upswing for the door instead of a downswing for the door because I, I don't know, I, that's just what I preferred. You can actually change it so that you can have the hinges underneath if you wanted so that it was, you know, would swing down versus up. I just preferred it this way and it gave me a nice big opening so that I could put my outdoor grill inside of there, things like that. And then I'll show you later on in the probably step three on how I put straps and things like that underneath here to hold the um, stove and stuff in place. But this is just a picture, a top view of the final product. As you can see, the doors and everything like that are perfectly balanced. The copper sink just looks beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker for a copper sink, so I don't know, you know, everybody else may be or may not, but you know, it, it is whatever you pick. You can paint it any of the other colors that you can find. There was a wide variety of colors. I do highly recommend, it. this isn't a paid anything. I highly recommend the Rust-Oleum enamels. They just tend to hold up a lot better for this. We're going to move on to curtains and cushions and the different materials I used and some of the techniques that I personally like versus other techniques that are out there. I'm not going to go too much into detail on how I sewed and what I did and different things. You can find so many videos on YouTube going over different ways to sew curtains and different ways to make cushion covers. I will, however, give you my three or four opinions on the best type of techniques and what I used to do this. Now, the first thing I always, as it's just a simple tip, is make sure you do research on your materials. You kind of want something a little bit waterproof, something that will repel. You can scotch guard things if you want to do it yourself. For the most part, though, you can actually buy some quality, cheap fabrics. And I don't want to say cheap because it makes it sound cheap, but quality inexpensive fabrics that will actually work very well inside a pop-up and hold up to the testament of the different moistures and different things, elements that they're going to be exposed to. As you can see here for my bunk and privacy curtains, I actually went with a thinner material, almost like a satin, I don't want to say it's a silk, but it's like a faux silk. This way, when the bunk end curtains are closed, you actually get the privacy that you're looking for, but it also is light enough that you can, it still breathes. Air and stuff still makes its way through the curtains. The second thing I always highly recommend is take your time. I know some people out there like to do the fold and staple or the, you know, the quick material. Over time, you're going to have to replace that. It's almost inevitable. Um, so you, you want to take your time and sew things correctly. Three different materials. So as you can see here, I used a vinyl backed fabric. This I found very inexpensive at Walmart and was actually thinner than a lot of the other materials out there, but still gives you that vinyl protection. Here are some jokes. I send out things. I pulled out my 1970s Singer sewing machine, WD-40 it up and got ready to work. Make sure you use a pin cushion because as I learned here, yeah, that wasn't real fun. Don't reach your hand into a giant bin. Also work on a hard material or a hard surface because as you can see here, my very first curtain, I pinned it to the carpet and it took me forever to get it off the carpet. So now moving on to the cushions. Now, again, like I said in the last section, everybody goes to the fold and staple or the quick pocket or the iron on tape or, you know, something like that to make these cushions. I personally don't prefer that. What I actually did was I made three cuts. I made two end pieces and one large regular piece. The only thing I regret not doing is, is I should have put a zipper on the back of it. But as you can see here in the curtains, I made pockets or not curtains, geez, on the <laughs> cushions, I made pockets. So I made one long piece that wrapped around the cushion and then I made cut two end pieces, sewed one end on and then sewed the top part of the back end on and then hand sewed the outside edges. It sits nice and snug on the material. 
the wood backer is able to actually put some, um, what do they call them, upholstery nails in the back of it to get to the, you know, so the material doesn't slide around. And ultimately, I just like the look that came out of this. Again, I'm not saying that any other way is wrong. It's just not my personal preference for, you know, if I'm putting this much work and effort into the cushion. So as you can see here, I used two different materials. The top material is actually a printed vinyl backed material. Um, on the back side of it, it also has vinyl. I did that because it's on the street cushions that are close to the windows. If for some odd reason you know, you're camping and you forget to close your windows, it will not see through. These are just some pictures, again, of the entire finished product. Um, I got our ceiling fan, not ceiling fan, window fan that we I made a track for so that it can hang perfectly at the top of the window to blow all the hot air out of. Um, but I just liked all in all every how everything worked out for this pop-up. The roof is one of my favorite things. I could just lay in one of the bunk and stare at the roof all day long. It gives you that nice cabin feel. You don't feel like you're in a camper, but you know that you are in a camper. You kind of feel like you've gone away to your weekend cabin. Um, the table is in another video, which I, you know, if you're looking through my channel and you enjoyed this video, I hope you, you know, subscribe and follow along. Um, I did make that and I will be finishing that probably in another video with an epoxy on top of the wood that I made and I still got to do the um, trim moldings for the outside edges of it. So here's just some pictures of us camping. Our favorite time to go is for Christmas in July. Um, so these are just pictures of me out doing things that are me just being me. So I want to thank you for watching. And if you like this video, please hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, hit that bell notification. And you just keep doing the things being you while I do the things that are me just being me. Thank you.